speak to about 100,000 people a year, and I speak about power. That's what I speak about. Really simple. I speak about power, how to find personal power inside yourself to make a difference in the world, to create transformation, not only in your own lives, but in the organization that you work for, for your own organization and the school and your family. I just talk about power. Really, really, really uh, simple. So, I have been an entrepreneur. I started my first company at 22 years old. I was a world surfing champion a long, long time ago. I'm still very passionate about my surfing. I've uh, studied at university. I did a BCom here at KwaZulu-Natal. I went back and did a master's in the United States, a master of science in leadership. So I've been an athlete. I've studied hard. And all of us come across interesting readings in what we do. And I've got to tell you, every single one of you that's an entrepreneur, you've got to buy this little book. It's called Five Questions. If you want to write it down, Five Questions. And it's written by the single greatest management theorist in the history of the world, the guy that developed management science, which has now become leadership, written by a guy called Peter Drucker. And he says every single entrepreneur needs to ask themselves five questions. And I'm going to talk about the first question and the fifth question today. First, what's your mission? And whatever your mission is, it needs to fit on a T-shirt. How simple is that? What's your mission? There's a young bloke sitting next to the dad. What's your name again? Tom. Tom. Tom said to me, you know, I'm trying to figure out my mission. Your mission needs to fit on the T-shirt. Question number one. Question number two, who's your customer? Question number three, what is your customer value? I can't help you with those two questions. Question number four, what are results? What are the results you want to achieve? And question number five, what's your plan? What's your plan? So I'm going to talk today about mission and plan, all in the context of the sport that I love, which is surfing. So I'm going to talk about a code, a code that can help you with your plan and a code that can help you find power. So it's like two parts, my little talk with you today. And let me see if I can get this thing working. Find your purpose, find your path, find your power. Super simple. And behind all the stories I'm going to tell you today is solid academic data and solid academic research. I'm not just standing up here and bullshitting on some airy-fairy theory. I'm talking fact, and for all you entrepreneurs, I'm talking power. So I'm going to give you the code. And I talk to 100,000 students a year, from eight years old to 24 years old. And I talk about this code that can help you activate the power inside you. And the code is really simple equation. A will equals power. A will equals power. I was just up in Kwadakuza municipality, spoke to about 15,000 kids. And at every event, I went to the poorest schools in the nation. The poorest schools in the nation with mud floors, with holes in the roof, with toilets, drop toilets. And in every school I went to, I had kids. A will equals power. Starting off with a whisper, a will equals power. Until every single school was thundering with those words. I swear they were raising the rafters. A will equals power. A will equals power. And it does. What you will you will become. Super simple ethos. What you will, you will become. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you two things. One, I'm going to give you the code. And two, I'm going to give you a perspective of a life that's been lived with passion and purpose. My life. My path. But what I'm not doing is I am not in any way, shape, or form giving you a prescription. I'm not up here telling you a path to follow. I'm giving you the code and I'm giving you a perspective. I'm not up here to tell you what to do. So just a little bit of a brief background, because I know a lot of you guys have, um, you know, know, know nothing about my background. I grew up on Durban Beach. Uh, that's a photo of my mom. My mom was a survivor. She endured 4,500 air raids during the Second World War on the island of Malta, the most heavily bombed place in the history of the entire world. 
Ultimately, the island was almost bombed out of existence. All the inhabitants starved. She was evacuated and ended up in South Africa with her mom. And my mom said to me, the first time they walked down what was then West Street in Durban after they'd been in the war for three years living underground in air raid shelters, she walked down and saw that Indian Ocean. And my mom is now 89 years old. And last year she said, you know, when I first saw the ocean, I thought, <clears throat> whenever I see the sea, I feel free. How cool is that? And she told me this like so many years later. So she ended up in South Africa, married my father. At a young age, my father was a South African swimming champion at 13 years old, one of the great athletes in the country. And his dream was to represent South Africa in the Olympics. But life had another plan for my dad. He was out in the water, swimming and practicing on a little wooden surfboard. And these are his words I found about two years ago. I was lifted clear from the water. Zambezi shark came up underneath him and hit him so hard, it threw him into the air and in one bite nearly bit his arm off. Dropped him back into the water and started circling him. He said, Sean, I've never ever been so frightened in my life. Dropped him back in the water and the water was filled with blood. All of his friends bailed out. He had a whole crew of friends. I bailed out and he said the shark was circling him. And, and I used to say to my daddy, what happened to the shark? You know, like, what happened to the shark? Like, did the shark come back and bite you? He said, don't worry about the shark. It died of blood poisoning. <laughs> that was my dad's vibe on the terrible tragedy. But he never lost this incredible love that he had for the ocean. And my mom never lost this positivity and hope that she had. And they both, I think, infected me with passion and with love for the ocean. So I grew up surfing <clears throat> right at this little break called the Bay of Plenty right in front of our home. You see in the white water there in the picture, that's where I stood up for the first time on my board. And as a surfer, Mark mentioned it. You know, you paddle into that wave and you stand up for the first time and you see the world differently. Your life is transformed in that one moment. Wow. You stand there and you just look out at that world and you're riding on this invisible band of energy and you feel this primal connection to nature and you just know, wow, man, I'm in the right place at the right time. So I started competing. I became an instant success. I got third in my very first surfing contest. Okay, there was only three of us in the contest. <laughs> <laughs> but I copped the third. <laughs> uh, uh, eventually, I started to do a little bit better than third out of three. Uh, that's my picture of, of my dad and I. My dad loved my, my surfing career. Ultimately, I went on to win a, a big event in South Africa called, called the Gunston 500. I, I won it six times, the world's first surfing professional event. And when I was up in Durban uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were celebrating 50 years of this event that my father had started. And we had this huge celebration up there uh, in connection with, uh, with the local city council. And uh, when I was up there, we erected a plaque uh, to my father on one of the benches that overlooks the surf in honor of his memory. And I wrote this copy that really epitomizes uh, who my dad is. And I wrote, he loved surfing and he loved surfers. And he loved the honor of competition. And when, he, when I was a young guy starting on my career as a surfer, he, he would say this to me, Sean, when you win, and winning's easy, Win like a gentleman. And when you lose, losing is what defines you. Lose like a man. And for all you women out there, this is not meant in any way, shape, or form to be like a sexist statement, but it's like when you lose, and every single one of you, your asses are going to get kicked, you lose with power. Because it gives you the power to paddle back for the next wave. So that was a great lesson from my dad as a, as a young boy. I became a successful pro. I won the World Surfing Championships in 1977. I won 19 major pro events. You know, I was on the covers of all the mags and girlfriends and all that stuff. And <laughs> it was a pretty cool life. And then I married my beautiful girl, and we've been married now for 31 years. How about that? <laughs> and my wife, let me tell you, is a hottie, too. I'm very lucky. I always say to her, I'm lucky. I married you then, because now I would have no chance. And I know your husband says the same thing, eh, Michelle? Well done. So um, I started my first company when I was 22 years old, same age as a lot of you entrepreneurs. It was called Instinct. 
Let me tell you, anyone over the age of 30 or maybe 35 in South Africa remembers the brand Instinct. We were the number one brand in the entire nation, and it just started from a thought. Like all you guys and girls who are entrepreneurs, it starts, man, with that thought, with that mission. And I'll tell you how Instinct started. I was known in surfing, like for riding inside the tube. That was like my thing. And the very, very best moments in surfing happen when you're inside that tube. And the very best tubes happen when you're operating on instinct. So my brand came from what I really love. And for all of you, when you think of that brand name that represents you, you better think of something insane that's great, that represents your power and your passion. So instinct became successful. We did this super cool ad campaigns. We were the first sort of surfing company in this new wave of surfing that represented the lifestyle. We didn't want to talk about surfing as a sport, surfing like world champion stuff. It was like for us, yes, we had sponsoring uh, world surfing champions, but it was all about the lifestyle, what differentiated surfing from the mainstream. Surfing is life, the rest is details. These were all award-winning uh, advertising campaigns. This was one of my favorites. Waiting for waves is okay. Most people spend their lives waiting for nothing. <laughs> so I said to you, instinct was started from tube riding. So tube riding, like most of you don't know what tube riding is. So tube riding is this moment in surfing when you actually surf right inside this liquid tunnel of water. You stand there and you're rushing inside this tube that forms when waves break and when waves break upon themselves. And when these waves break upon themselves, they create this aerated foam that you can actually ride upon. So it's like you're riding this slippery snake through this molten barrel of water. And this barrel of water is actually falling in slow motion. It's like you're riding inside a cyclone. But a cyclone that at any moment, if you make one mistake, bang, it's going to throw you and bury you on that razor sharp coral reef that you might be riding over. So you get this excitement and you have this fear and you have this exhilaration all melded together into this one experience. And when you're surfing at your absolute, absolute best, the psychologist that I met and done some research on his work and his university has been researching my work calls it a state of flow. His name's Miha Csikszentmiha, the most famous positive psychologist in the world. And he maintains that the state of flow, the state of optimal performance and maximum concentration is reached when you are operating on the absolute outer edge of your ability and you're faced with a maximum challenge. And then you're in this state of flow. And it can happen to any of your entrepreneurs when you're like really focused on your work, you're being creative, and time just seems like it's expanded. And when you're riding inside that wave, it seems like the tube is breaking in slow motion. And sometimes when you're operating at your very best in the state of flow, you feel you can actually curve this wall to your will. And this is what it looks like. And you're getting into a deep barrel. It certainly feels like time's expanding. Like life has slowed down. I felt that I could curve that wall to my will. I really felt that. It's a magical, magical moment. It's a crazy moment. My God, he changed the way we rode tubes. And, oh, it's like all of us at the time. We were thinking about what we could do to leave our mark. And Sean you know, had a huge influence of, of the evolvement of modern day tube riding. He's doing things on like Singleton in the 70s that uh, you know, a lot of guys aren't doing on the thrusters now. Um, you know, the barrel shots, there's some slow motion shots of him riding the bone ball. Uh, just unbelievable modern, way ahead of his time, barrel riding. So how about that feeling? I could curve the wall to my will. I thought I could bend time and space. You know, Beckham, I'm sure you dudes have heard of Beckham. He had a little ball man, weighing about, what's a football weigh? Eight ounces? A wave weighs hundreds of tons. 
And when you feel that you can curve it to your will, you just feel connected to nature, connected to God. It's the most amazing sensation. So after my surfing career was over, I still continued tube riding. <laughs> Maybe not at that level, but I still love tube riding. I uh, sold Instinct in uh, 1990 when I retired from the professional tour. And uh, after living in South Africa for a number of years, I got an offer from an amazing company in the United States. You guys should read about this company. It's called Patagonia. One of the most famous companies in the world in terms of product sustainability, social purpose, the leading company in the entire world in this. I was hired by the uh, owner, a guy called Yvonne Chouinard, amazing individual, wrote a great book called Let My People Go Surfing. Loves surfing, loves outdoor, and the company is really focused around profit and purpose, mission and economic sustainability. And I worked for them for a couple of years. It was a, it was a wonderful experience, and while I was there, a number of years before, I had been contacted by a guy called Glenn Henning, who was starting an organization called Surfrider Foundation. He said, Sean, we're just starting this new organization, an environmental organization. Uh, the world's waves, ocean and, oceans and beaches are under threat. He said, I want you to be our first ambassador. I was the number one guy in the world at the time in 1984. He said, I want you to be our ambassador, and I want you to be on our first poster. I said, sure, I'll get you a picture. And I said, I'll even write the copy for your first ad. I'm not a copywriter, but I thought this was pretty good copy. <laughs> Do a good turn today. That was our ad. First ad for Surfrider Foundation that came out in 1984. Today we have 60,000 members. We have about 50 chapters around the world. It's the world's biggest surfing environmental organization. But by coming associated with this group, for no financial benefit towards myself other than trying to help them, trying to do a good turn. Ultimately, this was the genesis for my life moving in a different direction. And to all of you entrepreneurs out there, yes, profit is vitally important. Yes, one has to have economic sustainability. You all have to and should be trying to make a difference. At the time, I, I was going, man, it sounds like a groovy organization. I want to be associated with it, do a good turn. So the association grew, became successful, and then after I was working at Patagonia, and working with Yvonne Chouinard, Yvonne would say to me, hey, Sean, you know, we don't really have a big company. Our company's 156 million bucks. I was in charge of the surfing division, which was about a $46 million division. He said, I want to do something bigger. And I helped him. Well, when I say helped him, he said to me, I want you to put together the mission statement. I said, well, what's your mission? So how is this, this dude? He's a small bloke. He's about this big. He's got a $156 million company. Let me tell you, in the context of American business, it's a company about that big. He said, to change the world. I went, what, Yvonne? He said, that's my mission, to change the world. And today, this company has changed the economic landscape in the United States. And I went, wow, one dude having so much incredible power in a small company. How business can be used to transform society and transform the world. And this whole economic sustainability that American and South African companies are now came from the brain of this little guy, um, Yvonne Chenard. So I worked for him for a while, it was a great experience, and then ultimately I left him and my wife and I started our own company. We started a company called Solitude. And when we had our brand, the same guy that had phoned me up about Surfrider Foundation phoned me up and he said, hey, Sean, your local surfing break is under severe environmental threat. This is my adopted home break of Rincon. He said, when it rains, all the homes of those multi-million dollar homes that are on the point there are connected to septic tank systems. When it rains, they overflow and the crap flows out in the river. There's a little river. Is it working? Anyway, there's a little river in the middle of that break and the crap flows out into the lineup. The surfers are getting sick. He said, I want to do something about it, and I want you to help me. He said, I've got a $100 budget. A $100 budget. I'm going to help him solve this severe environmental problem where homeowners that have homes, the cheapest home there is about $8 million. That's about $8 million. What's that in Rand? It's got to be 100 million Rand. Yeah. The cheapest home. 
I said, these guys aren't solving their own problem. How, how can I help with a hundred bucks? He said, well, I'm having a group of a hundred children come to the beach and we're bringing down the TV cameras and we're bringing down the media. We want to highlight this problem. And through highlighting the problem, we think we can get the local government to activate and solve this issue. Hundred bucks, I'm going, like, what can I do with a hundred bucks? At the time, my wife and I had our company Solitude. We made super cool shirts. I thought maybe I'll give the hundred kids a shirt and it will activate environmentalism in their mind. It will make them conscious of this, of this issue and maybe the media will, will well, check this out and you know, we can solve the problem. So then I did something different. And I promise you, what I did next changed my life. And I'm standing up here and there's no bullshit associated with what I'm talking about. What I did next changed my life. And I changed it with a pen, with 105 words. So I wrote this, sat down in front of a little piece of paper and I wrote 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. And I called it surface code. And those 12 lines were a summary of everything that surfing had taught me about life, about camaraderie, about courage, about honor, about integrity, about determination, about commitment. 12 lines. Every line begins with those two words, I will. 12 lines. Every line begins with those two words, I will. I will equals power. And I printed up little cards, a hundred cards. I know you entrepreneurs are very sensitive about budgets. What do you think a hundred cards cost me? No. I wouldn't want you doing my budgeting process. Eh? No way. My budget was a hundred bucks. Cost me a hundred bucks because I'm an entrepreneur and I know how important budgets are. I printed up a hundred cards. So how can a hundred cards change your life? So I gave a hundred cards to the kids that came to the beach about a week later. We had the media down there and the media thought it was such a cool thing and card about the surfing and about the metaphors. And then the government heard about it and saw the kids there and saw the kids being stoked. And we got the government to solve the problem. All the homeowners got connected up to the sewer line. So we solved the environmental problem. Done. Okay, deal number one, done. But then the cards started to take on a life of their own. People liked the cards. They wanted more cards because these cards represented goodness. These cards represented commitment. These cards represented power. So we started getting requests for the cards. Printed another hundred, printed another thousand, printed another 10,000, and then we started putting them in the pockets of our clothing. Like someone would buy a pair of board shorts, there was a surface code card. It like, looks like a little credit card. Still carry one around in my wallet, along with my 15 rand note. Surface code, just a tiny little card, 12 lines, 105 words. Every word begins with, with our will. So now we're putting them in our clothing. We made a lot of clothing then. Hundreds of thousands of these cards are just filtering out into the community. Kind of stealth, you know, below the radar. People just getting a card, that's pretty cool. And I start getting calls from people. Why don't you come and talk at my business? Why don't you come and talk at my school? Why don't you come and talk at my company about a code, about honor, about integrity, about power? So I start talking. I start just telling stories about those 12 lines. Guy phones me up, he said, oh, I'm having a leadership conference. We've heard you tell some cool stories. Why don't you come and talk at my conference? I mean, okay. He said, we've got a couple thousand people. I mean, okay. I said, well, how do I fit in the program? He said, well, you're gonna be the first speaker. He said, after you's gonna be Richard Branson. After him is gonna be Malcolm Gladwell. I'm going, <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> I've taken off at the Banzai Pipeline 15 feet. Man, I can handle this. So, I'm telling you, the code started developing more and more power and more interest. And at one of the events I was at, I was talking about the code, and a guy came up to me and said, Sean, you should write a book. I went, ah, I've never written a book. He said, well, I'm a professor of, li of French literature. I know a lot about writing. I've never written a book, but let's collaborate. So over a summer, we produced my first book called Surface Code, and it became uh, very popular around the world. And, uh, 
for all of you entrepreneurs out there, it's, it's a super cool thing, you know, when you, when you write that book and you write down like what has been meaningful and important uh, in your life. And people, you know, really liked the book. It came out in 2006. And, and for me, it was, you know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful achievement. So I'm sitting out at Rincon right after I published the book at the same place that had that environmental problem. And a guy paddles up to me, he says, Sean, I'm a headmaster at a local school. I want you to come and talk at my school about the code. I want you to talk about honor and integrity and what's inside your code and inside your book. So I cruised out the school, small school, 80 students, Schools in like a little farmhouse. The local media comes down. You can see there I'm in front of the blackboard like a teacher. And I got the code up and I'm rapping to the students. And when I'm talking to the students, I say, I get a brainwave. You know, like brainwave, like brainwave. It's a shit joke because no one ever laughs at it. <laughs> but it is a brainwave. Life, I'm telling you, and energy moves in waves. I get this brainwave of connectivity. I say, surface code's my code. 105 words. Every line begins with our will. It's mine. What about you writing your own code? 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. Write your mission. Write your purpose. Find your power. 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And now I'm at home going, whoa, now what's going to happen next when these lighties... Write their code, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. So now I get the codes back. 80 kids, 12 lines, I get 960 lines of code back. And the very first line I get back from this young girl, Elena Alcera, I'll be myself. I'll be myself. Power, raw power, I will be myself. And all those other amazing words, I will do what I say I will do integrity, honesty. I will do what I say I will do. I will do what I enjoy. I will not do what other people want me to do simply to please others. It was like, here's Lattes raising that flag of power. I will do what I say I will do. I will be me. Last night, a young girl at the super poor, or yesterday, a young girl at a super poor school, I will rise. I will rise. At another school I was at, little girl, about that big. When I say this school was poor, this school had nothing. A thousand kids. She walks up in front of her whole class. She's that big. Huge matric students, I mean big people. I will be a powerful black woman. Let me tell you, the school erupted. The young kids finding their power, finding their path, finding their purpose. So I got so inspired by like these writings, I went, I'm going to do another book. And I read another book, and every single line of my latest book is written by a student. Not by me, but by a student. I'll be myself, the first line. I will dream, etc. Okay, so the book's got 12 chapters. Why are there 13 lines up there? Check it out. 12 chapters, there's 13 lines. Why? Also your Pardon? Because you also included your No, but that's a good answer. But, but why are there 13 lines? I'm not moving on until someone tells me. Mike? No, but it's a good answer. No, but it's a good answer. No? Pardon? There are two I will be myself. And why? Huh? What did you say? Schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. That's an interesting answer, but I can see from your background in communication or lying and cheating, maybe. <laughs> okay, no, nah, come on. Tell me why I will be myself is repeated. Because, Chompa, it's the most important. Exactly. Right on. I will be myself is the most important. So now I get lines of codes from tens of thousands of kids all around the world. This is one of my favorites. Hey, Sean, I met you tonight at Flower Hill Wall Mall, and your words just resonated with me. I knew he was a surfer kid. 
because only surfer kids spell resonated that way. Like resin, like you put resin on, on a surfboard. So now I go around to schools and I speak at schools and I talk to them about power, purpose, and finding your path. And sometimes kids will do these amazing graphics. Check them out. I'll let my dreams outshine my fears. Just beautiful emotive stuff. I'll follow my dreams. I'll follow my own path. I will design. I will be unique. These are kids in Durban. I will be different. Different. The dude's riding a great white shark. Super drift different. I will focus on my future. I'll be a positive vibe. So kids making these powerful statements about their life, about where they are, and about where they want to be. <clears throat> so now why does this have any relevance to all of you who are entrepreneurs, you want to be successful, you want to make a difference, you want to make an impact. So I went back to grad school. I did a Master of Science and Leadership a few years back. I was actually the oldest student in the whole university. I think I was older than the oldest lecturer. But I loved going back and learning. And I came across this interesting study called The Ripple Effect by Sigal Basada at Yale University about emotional contagion, how all of us by our emotions can influence each other positively or negatively. And they call it the ripple effect. You can imagine, you drop a stone in the water, it creates a ripple, and hopefully it's going to turn into a wave. I came across another study. This was the single biggest social study in the history of the world, and you've never heard of it. 689,000 people. And I promise you, the Russians read this study. And this study was the basis for hijacking the American election. And they proved massive scale emotional contagion through social networks. You can influence and change other people's behavior by what you write on social media. Positive results in positive, negative results in negative. So I'm thinking, man, some of you know my story. Many of you don't, but I lost my beautiful 15 and a half year old son to a poor choice, to negativity, whether it was peer pressure, we don't know, he played a dangerous game, found out about this game from kids at his school, and I lost my son when he was 15, 15 and a half. So I was super motivated, how can I inspire and influence kids to go on a positive path, to catch a positive wave? How can I, as one bloke who suffered, create a positive wave? So I find a guy who's built a wave. His name's Kelly Slater. He's a world champion. Check this wave out. Perfection here with technology from Kelly Slater's wave company. All the engineers on hand to celebrate this historical day at the Future Classic. So at the time, I thought, man, that's the future. And I said to Kelly, how much your wave will cost? 35 million bucks. That's the starting point. Then you have to buy 85 acres of property to put the pool on. The pool only generates a wave every four minutes. So if all of us rode 10 waves, it could only accommodate 5,000 surfers a year. So that's like an $80 million investment to get 5,000 surfers stoked. But how can I get hundreds of thousands of people stoked? How can I get people to fire up their energy and collectivize their energy and make an impact? How can I help 
create a positive wave across a nation. And I promise you, all of us together can collectivize our energy and create a positive wave across our nation, especially you young entrepreneurs, because you young entrepreneurs have the power. Business is going to make the change. Government ain't going to make them the, the change. And all of you have great power to institute and activate great change. So my mission was to inspire students to inspire each other through words. Just like I wrote those 105 words so long ago that have continued to inspire me. So last year, I decided I would do a preliminary experience. I hooked up with Liberty Group, Pan Macmillan, a publisher, and said, listen, I want to do a positive wave tour across the nation. I want to visit the poorest schools, and I want to visit the richest schools. And this year, I continued with this tour at the Belido Bay Pro, went around to Quadacusa municipality, doing the same thing, getting kids to inspire each other. And the, the, the goal was to create a positive wave across the nation. I'd tell some stories. Kids would read my book. Book wasn't really part of the program, but they could if they wanted. The goal was to get kids creating a code and sharing a code. So I went last year, 24 schools, 30,000 students. One of the first schools I went to was a very poor school in Katlahong, up in, uh, near, near Johannesburg. <clears throat> now, when I was thinking, I'm going to the school. I'm a white dude. I came from the apartheid era. How are these young kids going to accept me and accept my story? Most of these kids have never heard of surfing, ever. Certainly, they've never, ever heard of me. How are they going to accept this dude coming to their school? Is my story going to be relevant? Are they going to laugh me off the stage? Like I said, I've dropped down a wall, 15-foot Banzai pipeline, life and death right there in that instant. I was as scared as when I took off on that wave at pipe, going to the school. So I stand up there, and at the same time, a TV station, China Global Television, the biggest TV station in the world, that phoned me up and said, Sean, you know, we'd like to come down and film you talking to kids. And okay, I'm talking to the Lani schools, Hilton Michael House, the best schools in the country, and the poorest schools. They said, we want to do a TV show on you talking to poor schools. I'm going, okay, you can come down there, but I don't know what's going to happen. Surfer Sean Thompson is one of South Africa's finest sporting heroes. Famous for his style of riding the tube section of the wave, Thompson won the International Professional Surfers World Championship in 1977. Considered one of the 10 greatest surfers of all time, he now inspires others to follow his paddle. In this underprivileged school in Katlahong on the east side of Johannesburg, Thompson shares with youngsters a simple strategy for confronting everyday challenges and making positive, life-changing decisions. It's so wonderful to be inspiring some young kid in Johannesburg or Durban or Los Angeles, anywhere, just to know that you drop a little pill in the water, and once it does, it's creating a wave. And that wave is going to go and touch love. In 12 personal stories, Sean shares the power of I Will, a code that carries him through life. Well, yes, this little code that I wrote, 12 lines that I wrote so many years ago, was about surfing. It's like every line is a metaphor, and can be interpreted in so many different ways. It's about how you can be a good person, how you can be a good human being, how you can make a difference in the world, how you can impact others. So I've been on this journey for 10 years now since I lost my beautiful son. And surfing was this constant. Surfing helped get me back on the path to healing again. Many of these teenagers have barely seen the beach, but the code has resonated among them. I will achieve my goals. I will be better. I will dream big, and I will be who I want to be. I will arrive in shine, and I will face my fears, and I will take charge of my life. Although all these youngsters were born after apartheid, many of them are still trapped by poverty. But the code is giving them courage to change their lives. As a country, I deprived the right of opportunities, and I will break that cycle of being deprived of opportunities, and I will create opportunities for myself. This book will give me the courage that I don't have. It, I think it will give me that power to do what I want to do and to believe in myself. Sean Thompson's The Code is about many things. Faith, courage, creativity, determination. 
but above all, it's about promises we make to ourselves about the future and to turn hope into action. Judy Shar, CGTN, Katahong, South Africa. Talk about power. <laughs> Thank you, but the incredible power that those young students showed by making those statements. I mean, I had no idea. I just went and spoke, went home, she sent me the link, and then she must have gone and asked these students about what do you want to say? And it was so empowering and inspirational for me to see that the message of the sea, the message of surf, the message of goodwill resonates throughout the economic strata, throughout the diversity of colors that we are all born with. It just has pure power. So I went around the country and I had these amazing experiences. This was a very moving experience with Ochlanga School. If you don't know what Ochlanga School is, first school in South Africa started by a black man. It was when Nelson Mandela voted in 1994 at the gravesite of Dr. John Dubey with those words, I've come to report, Mr. President, that South Africa is now free. I was there two days ago, again, at the invitation of the principal, Justice Mishali. I did two fundraisers for them. We raised about 50,000 50, bucks for them for their library and for their, their spawning equipment. And about two weeks after I, was, uh, I spoke at his school, which was just such an amazing uh, experience, I get this email from him from his little daughter. She's seven years old and now she's taken this whole program to her school. She's in grade one. She's a tiny little girl, she's about this big. She's taken this whole program throughout her school and she meets with the principal and she says, Sean, I want you to come and visit my school, Northwest Primary. And two days ago I went and visited uh, her school, Northwest Primary and it was just such an amazing moment. And she sent me this little video. Yes. Hi, Sean. Hi, Sean. My name is Ali. This is my sister. Hey, our father is Justice. The principal of the Sunday High School. So, he is so young for the world. Who is it? Who is it? So, our dad gave us the book, the course. And Jess inspired our hearts. So remember this name, Anel Michali, because you are looking at the first female president of South Africa, I'm telling you that. So I went right across the nation to these amazing schools, Subasiwe School near Amanzam Toti, right above the South African Constitution. He has a picture of Martin Luther King, the famous American civil rights leader with his speech, I had a dream. This was most probably the most poignant moment that I've ever had in my life. The principal, Ernest Mungani in Corsi, I met him when he was a young boy working in my mom's garden. He said, Sean, I want to continue my schooling. I have no money. I gave him money for his school. It was like nothing for me. I was a pro surfer, making tons of money. Gave him some money, finished his school. After he finished school, he said, Sean, I want to go to university. I got no money. I gave him money for university. It was nothing for me to do that. Continued with his university education. I helped him through university. And then I lost touch with Ernest Bongani and Corsi. I came back to South Africa a few years ago. He contacted me. He said, Sean, I've got to tell you about my life. I want to think of this story. He said, I'm a principal of 1,600 students. I have two university degrees, two teaching credentials, 
and I want you to come and speak at my school, man. Hey. And I spoke at his school, and he stood up and spoke before me, and I told you, I've spoken with Malcolm Gladwell and Richard Branson, who are the finest speakers in the world. Let me tell you, Ernest Bongani and Corsi blew doors on all of them. He was amazing, and it was an amazing experience for me. I went to, obviously, privileged schools, Peter Maritzburg College, all over the country, Michael Houses, and these famous, iconic South African schools pulled the code into their curriculum. Their, their character studies, we will not be afraid to go against the status quo. We will have the strength to make our voices heard. Schools like St. Stithians, Crawford College, all these kids are writing their codes. And I continued with it this year uh, up at uh, up around the Belido Bay area with the Quadacusa City Council. And also, you might think, oh, this is a pretty cool thing for kids. You know what I mean? It's like a little vibey thing, little school exercise. But how can it help me in my business? How can it help me rock? How can it help me be successful? So, I'll show you. Natal Sharks. You know them, like one of the top rugged teams in South Africa? Losing, losing, losing. So I go and rap to the sharks. I said, this is a simple way. Find your purpose, find your path, find your power. They win the next game. <laughs> I'm not taking full credit. <laughs> I'm not taking full credit, but I say, as an athlete, you know, in surfing competitions, they're not won by points, but they're won by decimal points. As an athlete, I know that victory doesn't come in meters, it comes in millimeters. And you never know where that little extra drop of stone into the water creates a ripple, creates the wave that you can ride to success. So we got super cool media coverage. This was an amazing moment I had. I went to uh, a, a little school and got all the kids stoked. Uh, went around the whole area, just inspiring kids, getting them to share their codes. Walking up to the stage, kids that were so shy and sharing their power with their other students. I will rise. I will be a strong black woman. I will not look to the past. I will look to the future. I will not be a victim of my circumstances. I will find my inner power. Just beautiful words of power and passion. And it was just a great moment for me to see the positivity and power in South African youth regardless of the circumstances. Because let me tell all of you entrepreneurs, your circumstances do not define you. Your circumstances do not define you. And these kids showed me that the power and hope, optimism, love, and goodwill is alive in these South African schools that have absolutely nothing. So Justice Mchali from Ochlanga School, who had their little dynamite daughter, Anel, who I think one day is going to be president of South Africa, said to me, Sean, you've got to come to my school. And this is the reaction that the students at her school two days ago gave me. such an awesome experience. So kids created graphics and we just like created this whole like movement around Quadacusa and got kids inspiring each other. And all I did was just gave a little tool. So if any of you are athletes, like how can this help athletes? So there was a young Hawaiian surfer I was watching a few years ago, one of the top surfers in the world, but he couldn't get out at 25th place. His name was Zeke Lau. 25th, 25th, 25th. And I really admired his talent. I loved the way he surfed. He was a power surfer. I was a power surfer, he loved carving, I loved carving. So I sent him an email. Here's the email. Hey Zeke, write 12 lines, every line beginning with I will. This exercise is called writing your code and it's the ultimate map for your life tomorrow. It is the way for a warrior. So Zeke writes his code, I will be successful, etc. You can see his code up there. Flies out the following week to compete in South Africa for the first time at the Belito Bay Pro goes from 25th to 3rd, and a few months later wins one of the biggest contests in the world, and today is ranked in the top 10 in the world. I'm saying I'm not responsible for Zeke Lau's success, but that code 
can mean the difference between staying where you are and activating yourself on a different path. So now what I do, I've spoken a lot about kids and students. I work with the very biggest corporations in the world. And I do the same exercise that I do with a 10-year-old kid with a C-suite of companies that might have 150,000 employees, generating $150 billion in turnover. You know those names, General Motors, Pricewaterhouse, Cisco, Google, Toys R Us. Oh, Toys R Us went bankrupt, but don't blame me. Eh? <laughs> so I love doing this. I love sharing. And what companies do, and for all you entrepreneurs that might have teams or want to collaborate together, this is the simple exercise. Everyone sits together for 30 minutes. You write your code. 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. You write it in 30 minutes. You've all got a little sheet there. Right on the back of that sheet, there's a place where you can write your 12 lines. And then if you're in a team environment, I can see there's a whole little group of incubated desks there. You write your code, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. You write it in 30 minutes. And then one at a time, you stand up. Just like that little girl stood up in front of all her peers and said, I will be a strong black woman. You stand up with power and you read your 12 lines to your peers. I will what? I don't know what you will be. I will whatever you want to be. You write it down and you share it. And then you pick one line. And that one line goes up on a board, just like this company did. This is now in their lobby. This is a, each member of their team has got one line up there. I will act and not react. Just beautiful words of power. And this is what the CEO said. This is a coding company. The 60 most important lines of code our company has ever written. This was their, their, their sort of top uh, team. So it works well at a corporate level, just like it works well at a kid's level. This is a $270 million uh, a cosmetics company. I will reinvent myself. I will trust my gut. I will dream big. You never know what's inside you. You never know what's your purpose and power until you write it down. And when you share it, you collectivize that will. You collectivize that power, and it rises and raises everyone up. I did the same thing with the most famous positive psychology university in the world. This is the faculty. These are the statements from the faculty. Sitting in the audience is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, one of the most famous positive psychology uh, professors of all time. And it works so well at an intellectual level as it works at an organizational level. So just to summarize the code, and then I'm going to tell you one more story and we're going to end. The code method is a simple tool to activate will and commitment. What you will, you will become. I will equals power. I will equals power. I will equals power. I will equals power. So I want to tell you one last story. And the word that's right above my, word, my, my head there is connect. And I want to talk about connection. But before that, I want to show you one little video. You know, being an entrepreneur is hard. Eh? That door is closed. That door is closed. And the only way that you can get through the door is by busting it down. I made a movie about it a few years ago. A lot of surfers have seen it. It was called Busting Down the Door. And it was a movie about how young guys got together and created a new world for themselves.
were really, really into them. That guy kicked me across the park and I thought they were going to burn the house down. I had to have a police escort that was here against me. Really, we thought I'd die. I put a contract on my arms. Part of me wanted to leave, but I knew I couldn't run. This was my dream. Pretty gnarly stuff. They had to go and buy a 12 gauge semi automatic shotgun, pump 10 shells in that because they had so many death threats. Because these gnarly dudes felt that I disrespected their heritage and culture. It was tough times for a few weeks there until peace was declared and, and we had a, had a meeting. So, the last story I want to share with you is a story about connect and about connectivity. Because all of you aspiring entrepreneurs, you ain't going to do this on your own. You're going to have to build a team. You're going to have to pe have people that you can inspire with your mission, with your purpose. So this is a story called the Sacred Story Circle. And this, if you remember anything I've told you, I will equals power. And then the story of connectivity and the Sacred Story Circle. So this is about passing on my stoke. So stoke is this incredible feeling of exhilaration that surfers get. You can see I'm a stoke guy. I love surfing, love life. Yes, I've suffered, but I love life and I love passing on my spirit. I love passing on my stoke to other people. So the legend is, is that where I now live in Santa Barbara, California, that we live under the Rainbow Bridge. There's an island about 40 k's directly south of where I live. It's called Santa Cruz Island. And the Shumash, the Native American tribe that lived in the area, were created from a magic seed and they proliferated and proliferated and proliferated until they ran out of resources. They started to starve, and they asked the Hutash, the Earth Mother, please send us more food. We're starving. She said, no, but I'm going to build a magic bridge for you, and you can cross from the island to the mainland. She said, but don't look down. And one of the first things I said to you when I spoke today, I'm giving you a perspective. I'm not giving you a prescription, because prescriptions don't work as is evidenced by the Shumash people, because she told them not to look down. They looked down, they got dizzy, and they fell. And they fell into the sea, and they started drowning. So she didn't want her people to drown, so she changed them all into dolphins. So this whole channel is now filled with dolphins. I surf there all the time. And the legend is, is that's the Shumash Native American people transformed into dolphins. And right near where the Rainbow Bridge is supposed to have come down is my local beach, Hammonds Reef, half a mile from my home. And my beautiful boy, Matthew and I, our son, we used to love to surf at Hammond's Reef. Okay, that's not such a good day, but the surf cooks out there can get really good. But it's a beautiful refuge from sort of the busyness of life. And on this particular day, my son and I had gone down to the beach to check out the surf. There was no surf, no one on the beach. It was like hard wind, cold. And he said, Dada, let's check out the memorial. And right abutting the beach, there's a beautiful meadow where, like the Rainbow Bridge, is supposed to have come down. And you can see there's markings there where the Shumash people still do their sacred ceremonies. There's a memorial right in the middle of the meadow. And you can see the memorial with those beautiful dolphin inscriptions on it. And yes, whenever I pick up the paper in South Africa, there's like talk about land. And here's an inscription about land that I think is at the core of what land really is of the land lies in the mind of its people. This land is dedicated to the spirit and memory of the ancestors and their children. That's what land is really for. So we ran up to the memorial and Luke put down an offering. He put down a shell or a piece of stone. You can see the dolphins on there. And then he ran down to the beach, right down to here. And he started to pick up those stones that are on the beach and he arranged them in a large circle in the sand. And inside that circle, he arranged another circle of these cobblestones. Just my son, he was 10 at the time. And inside that circle, he made another circle of cobblestones. 
three circles of cobblestones in the sand. And in the innermost circle, he put two large rocks and ran off down the beach and got a stick, a piece of driftwood, put some shells and kelp and feathers on the stick and ran back to me and he said, Dada, this is a sacred story circle. How about that? This is a sacred story circle. And this is a sacred story stick. And we're going to sit inside that sacred story circle and we're going to tell each other stories. How amazing. What a gift. And he said, but there's a rule. Whoever's got the stick tells a story. What does the other person do? Listen. The other person listens. Perfect communication. So my son and I sat inside that sacred story circle and we passed the stick back and forth. The one told the story, the other listened. We shared our love, we shared our spirit, like soul to soul, heart to heart. There was no cell phone, there was no appointments, it was just me and my boy inside that sacred story circle. And I spoke at a large school in Hawaii a few years ago, it's the wealthiest school in the world, it's called Kamehameha School. I spoke in their chapel to about 4,000 students. And afterwards, the chaplain said to me, Sean, you know when you were speaking to your son, that's my boy, Matthew, our son, he said you were speaking in spirit language. Spirit language, how about that? What an amazing term for what we were doing together. And that's a profound term, and it really impacted me because it really defines what I do. I'm standing here today and I'm trying to speak to you every single one of you in spirit language. I'm trying to speak to you in the language of the heart. I'm trying to share my stoke with you. And when I was inside that circle with my boy, our spirits intersected at a deeply emotional level. And those moments are rare for one reason. They're rare because we make them rare. Because we're always so busy doing something else or sticking our cell phones out and wanting to be somewhere else. But the essence of humanity is to love and to be loved. And that moment inside the sacred story circle was so special to me and so resonant. But it ended, like all great things do. And I drove up the hill. I'm only about half a mile away from, uh, from where we were on the beach in the sacred story circle. And as I put my key in my door, see I've got a big yellow door in Santa Barbara, California. Matthew dug into his pocket. Matthew's name means gift from God. And he pulled out a stone. And I said, Matthew, what's that? He said, Dada, this is a sacred story stone from the sacred story circle. And you know all the stories we told today? They're all inside that stone. How about that? And he put the stone outside my front door. And you can check. Sacred story stone outside my front door. And it moves around our front of our house. And it'll be here and it'll be there. But it's always there. And every day when I go to put my key in the door, I check. Sacred Story Stone. And you know what? I can hear and I can feel the stories that we told that day inside the Sacred Story Circle. I can feel that beautiful wave emanation of that pure spirit that my son and I shared. And I tell you that story because it's about connectivity. And I tell you that story and I said to you it's the most important story because that is one of the most important aspects of business and entrepreneurship. Connecting with people, connecting with your team, connecting with people who you hope to be your customers, connecting with people who you hope to be your suppliers. Because you can't do it on your own, you can't do it as a one-man band. Connectivity and forming these sacred story circles. So just to summarize what I've spoken about, and it's been my great honor to share my spirit with all of you, the code has a simple ethos. What you will, you will become. I will equals power. I will equals power. The southeaster is going to roar through Cape Town. The northwester will roar through Cape Town. These winds will blow every single word that I've spoken to you today away. I've spent an hour of my valuable time here. You've spent an hour of your valuable time listening to me speak. Don't let the winds blow your words away. So I'm giving every single person here a call to action. We're all going to build this positive wave together through the positivity that we can generate, through the goodness and through the goodwill that we can all generate 
together. And this is how. It's super simple. Write your code. 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And write it in 30 minutes. Write your code. 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And importantly, share your code. Create that connectivity. Create that positive wave through sharing. Thank you.